Jerry. Yeah. And thank you again uh, on behalf of the Center for Indic Studies for coming to this seminar. Uh, this year, 2019, happens to be the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. So there are many, many programs that are being conducted all over the world. And we thought, why not we should also do some dedicated seminars based on this Gandhi theme. Just to give you a little background, our center, the Center for Indic Studies, it was established in October of 2001. And uh, when we were preparing for our inaugural, uh, then as you know in September, 9-11 happened. And at that time, there was um, a proposal, uh, many suggested that we should postpone our inaugural because of that event. But we said that because Gandhi is so central to the ideals of the center, and uh, so we didn't postpone it. So we were founded in October of 2001. So, uh, but today we will look at a particular aspect of Gandhi, and that is his debates with Rabindranath Tagore, the gentleman to your left. Uh, so Gandhi was born in 1869, died in 1948, assassinated in 1948. Rabindranath Tagore was born in 1861, so eight years senior to Gandhi, and he died in 1941. And these were two towering personalities of India uh, over, let's say, the 100 years from, let's say, 1850s to 1950s. <clears throat> they, they had amazing productivity. Gandhi's works, which is now compiled and it is known as collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, they run into 100 volumes, 100. Tagore, um, the, the collection is called in Bengali, Rovindra Rachanaboli. It has now about 31 volumes. But it's not really a true measure because it does not include his letters, for example, things like that. So if you include all that, that will also be very, very prodigious output. And they both, uh, from starting from their first meeting in 1915, they both uh, agreed on, at that time, of course, India was under British rule. And so freedom movement of India was paramount uh, for both of them. But they both agreed that this would be just a mile. So that means the political freedom would not be the end. Uh, that, that, that should only be a milestone. And they discussed a lot as to what the future India would look like, the, the independent India. Then both in different capacities, they were instrumental and pioneers in bringing in women and minorities to uh, the, the politics, uh, education, other aspects of society. So in the case of Tagore, he had uh, an institute called Shanti Niketan, which was perhaps the first place where women could come in for higher education. Gandhiji, his ashram, uh, that was also a very, in ashram, in fact, even before he came back to India in South Africa, it, he started this pioneering. Yes, Raj? So he started this pioneering approach of uh, giving women uh, leadership positions, not just mere equality. And we can extend that to uh, what I have written here as minorities. Uh, in the case of Gandhi, it was mainly depressed classes, as they used to be called at that time. Gandhi changed the name to religions. These were the, you can say, outcasts of Hindu society whose position was very bad. And uh, um, it was a blot to, to the society in general. So Gandhi did a lot of work in trying to uplift their status. And Tagore also. Uh, and we will discuss a little bit of it a little later. 
And then, so this we were talking of women and minor, minorities, but even within Hindu society, the need for reforms, how these reforms should proceed, what should be the framework of these reforms. They both had a lot of um, uh, ideas about it. <clears throat> Today we talk of environmental sustainability, uh, environmentalism, but uh, you, you may be astonished to know that 100 years ago, uh, both Gandhi and Tagore, in their own way, they were pioneers of this environmentalism movement. In Shanti Niketan Tagore, uh, he brought in these new agricultural technologies uh, for enhanced agricultural productivity in the ashram. Gandhi, of course, we know how, I mean, his famous quote was that, well, if India wants to ape the West, West at that time meaning Europe and USA, then there will be no resources available on Earth because it's just not possible. So those kinds of ideas, uh, they both had a lot to say about it. And they were both were very critical of what uh, they called it the industrial West. So they, most of the time, they used it under quotes, industrial West. This machine-based civilization, they both had tremendous objection to it. And uh, Tagore, in many of his compositions, plays, dramas, he, he spent no effort in scathing criticism, this mechanizing, I mean, this uh, subservience of mind to this me 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 mechanized uh, civilization, they had tremendous objection to it. Uh, at that time, of course, as I said, we were under the British, India was under the British control, and so the educational uh, framework was all British built, and they both, Gandhi and Tagore, they had ideas about a new educational policy. <coughs> which they both instituted in their ashrams to some extent or the other. Tagore in Shanti Niketan, Gandhi in Phoenix Farm, Tolstoy Farm, and then when he came back in and established the Sabarmati Ashram. The, in early 20th century, um, the Indian elite, uh, they, they all conversed in English only. India, Indian elite had become completely Anglicized or Anglophilic. And uh, so much so that uh, the vernaculars, India, as you know, has many, many languages, 17 or 18 official languages, and about 30 or 40 more, depending on how you count. So those vernacular languages were losing their prominence, were losing uh, literature, Etc. So both Gandhi and Tagore stressed the need to learn in the vernacular rather than in English. And um, India was and is still today very much a rural society, uh, but the condition of villages in India <coughs> was extremely bad. So, <coughs> excuse me, so the both. Uh, had ideas as to how to develop village-based societies. Again, not they were not using the same model, but they had ideas about it. So all I'm trying to say is they had many similarities. But I think the main, if, if you want to encapsulate that, that will be that we needed to, India needed to free its mind, and India needed to kind of use the mind as the beacon as to what would be the next steps. So there were all these similarities, but then why are we calling it the debates? That means debate means that they had some differences. And they had many, many differences. I gave you a list of some similarities. The differences were even more. And that's the amazing part. But both were extremely transparent about these differences. And when we say debate, we typically conjure up a physical space where both are present and they are arguing back and forth. In that sense, it was not really debate because they were not physically present in one place. They were both expressing their ideas through articles, essays, 
interviews, newspaper uh, articles, so forth and so on. So they, they had very clear differences, and they never shied away from it. Each was absolutely clear that here is, I disagree, and this is why I disagree. And uh, the most beautiful part is that even with these differences and debates, which I shall try to highlight some, their friendship, their mutual love, mutual respect, that did not dampen the least. Okay? So, uh, the idea being that when we talk of debate, we think that this argumentation is very antagonistic, is very hostile, but it need not be like that. Now, when we talk of the debates, um, debate is, of course, the English word that we use. In Sanskrit, in the Indic tradition, there are actually at least three words that we use for debate. So the first one is vad. And vad basically means that you, you establish your own arguments, and the opponent then listens to your arguments and then um, summarizes them or understands them and presents them and says, well, is this what you are saying? And only after you agree would he or she come up with the reply. Okay? So it's a very healthy argument. And the, 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 the goal in war is not really to defeat them. I when we talk of debate, we usually think of defeating somebody's argument. But in Vaad, in the Sanskrit term, it's not really the defeating per se, it is trying to establish your position and you contrast it, okay? Then we come to the next level which is called Jalpa. Jalpa is, the, 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 the central part of Vaad is still there, but now we have brought in some of these gimmicks, you know, this, uh, you twist the wording of your opponent, you, uh, find a weak uh, point and you then just drill through it. So, but, but you're still main, your goal is to establish your position. And then comes the, the worst part, which is called Vitanga. This is not really debate, this is rank. You just rank, you just try to um, oppose without putting any clear logic or any clear sequence. So, as much as I would like to say that Gandhi Tagore debates were in the first category, war, uh, I will give you some glimpses where you can argue that it did not confine itself to the war, it did get into the domain of Jalpa. Okay. But definitely not with us. So then the question is well, why should we be worried about 100 years later or more? I mean, in that time frame. And uh, when I was uh, uh, a school kid, uh, at that time in Hindi, there was a very popular song. It went something like this. That I will speak in Hindi first, and then I will translate. It said, Sikandar ne poras se ki thi ladai, jo ki thi ladai to main kya kar? Which basically means that in history, we learned that Alexander and Porus, they had a fight. But even if they had a fight, how does it matter to me? And so I need to answer that question for you all, that why does it matter? And the answer is it matters because this debates, this series of debates, they basically helped us, us meaning India, get into the heart of what is this concept of India. India, as you know, has been very ancient civilization, it has had many influences, but what would this framework be? And especially now when we are talking of debate in the 1920s, 1930s, so at that time, what was the role of, let's say, modernity, enlightenment, reason? So all that had to be incorporated into this concept of India, and these debates helped us do that. Then, these debates also set a roadmap as to how India will deal with the West. Because as you can imagine, uh, after more than 50, 60 years of British rule, before that uh, there was Mughal rule. So India felt that, I mean some parts of India, they felt that we have had enough of this outside influence. We need to kind of 
hermetically seal ourselves. And um, Tagore definitely did not agree to that. So I will try to give you some uh, flavor of that. Then, as I said before, uh, it was in the context of India's freedom movement, but this debate also helped us to clarify what would be the guiding principles of post-independent India. And uh, when India became independent, it established what is known as the Constitutional Commission. And when India was coming up with its constitution, which was formally uh, promulgated in 1950, many of these ideas that were in these debates did come up in that constitution, in the discussion as well. And whenever we have this kind of a debate between these two towering personalities, towering giants, then the question is, what is your ultimate goal? And the idea, of course, is for reaching that ultimate goal, you may have to sacrifice some of the lower goals. I mean, of course, whether you can call it a goal or not is a different question. But you, you need to establish that. So these debates help establish that. And finally, uh, as I will try to show you with some of the, these debates, uh, the goal was the same, as I said. And they themselves agreed. Tagore and Gandhi themselves agreed the goal was the same. But they differed in the means. And they uh, articulated as clearly as possible that the means are as important as the end. So just the end being the same, and we are different paths, so it doesn't matter that definitely was not something they could agree to. Okay. So now let's get to the debates. So as I said, they met, I mean, Gandhi, as you know, he went to England for his law education, came back, was a failed lawyer in Bombay. I mean, didn't get too much of traction. And as a, you can say, as a desperate measure, he went to South Africa. So he comes back from South Africa in 1914, I'm for good. And uh, their first meeting is in 1915. By this time, uh, Tagore has already won his Nobel Prize in 1913, so it's universally known to talk of India. So their, their first meeting, uh, of course, Gandhi knew, before the first meeting, Gandhi knew of Tagore's Shanti Niketan. And in fact, uh, before Gandhi came to India, he sent his boys of Phoenix Ashram to Shanti Niketan. They spent a few days there. And uh, Tagore also knew of Gandhi. Gandhi was not that well known in 1915. but. It so happened, incidentally, that Gandhi had come to India in 1901 in the Indian National Congress, which was held in Calcutta at that year. And at that time, he was, of course, coming as a petitioner on behalf of the Indians of South Africa. But he had a meeting with Rabindranath Tagore's elder brother, Jyoti Rabindranath Tagore. Jyoti Dada, Tagore used to call him. So Jyoti Dada and Gandhi, they met. And Jyoti Dada was very impressed with Gandhi. And of course, this news was communicated to the family. So when Tagore met Gandhi, he knew that at least Jyoti Dada had given him glowing recommendation. So they meet in 1915. And after their first meeting, each comes out with tremendous respect and in, in, tremendously impressed with the other. So I will show you two pictures of two people neither of them uh, the subject of our debates. Pranjeevan Mehta, a, a very well-known personality in Gandhi's biography. Gandhi was heavily influenced by Dr. Mehta. And why do I show this picture? I show this picture because Pranjeevan Mehta was the one who actually coined this honorific Mahatma for Gandhi. And this was way before 1915. This was in 1907. Okay, so the first uh, documented um, place of addressing Gandhi as Mahatma was by Pranjeevan Mehta in 1907. And similarly, Brahma Madhav Upadhyay, Brahma Bandhav Upadhyay, he's uh, well known in. Uh, he was well known as an intellectual in the Bengali elite when, when we talk of Bengali Renaissance. 
um, he is a very important figure. And he was also a very good friend of Tagore. And in fact, in 1901, he went with Tagore to what is known as Shanti Niketan. Now, at that time, Shanti Niketan had not been founded. And in 1901, he used the term Gurudev. And so today, universally, when we say Gandhi, we say Mahatma Gandhi. When we say Tagore, we say Gurudev Tagore. But these two people, much before the, the Gandhi Tagore first meeting, they used this. But what Gandhi and Tagore did was they took these and they they used it so so frequently that everybody else started using it. So Gandhi and Tagore they popularized uh, Gandhi Gurudev and Tagore Mahatma. And in all his letters, Tagore would say, "My dear Mahatma Ji." In all of Gandhi's letters, you will see, "My dear Gurudev." So this is a picture just I found. Uh, this is at a liter Gujarati literary conference in the 1920s. And uh, I, I, I like this picture because it's one of the very few photographs where Gandhi is seen wearing this cap. This cap in India is called Gandhi cap. But you don't find many pictures of Gandhi with this cap. Anyway, this So let's get to the heart of the debate. The first major disagreement occurred in 1921. And this was uh, because Gandhi, in some public meeting, somebody asked Gandhi, and the question was asked of Ramon Roy. Ramon Roy, very famous uh, intellectual of the early 19th century. Uh, and the question was asked, asked of Ramon Roy, and Gandhi said, as you can read, uh, Ram Mohan, and he also brought in Lokmanya Tilak, but we'll not talk of Tilak. Ram Mohan Roy were so pygmies, the word pygmies, who had no hold upon the people. And Ram Mohan would have been a greater reformer, and Lokmanya Tilak would have been a greater scholar, if they had not to start with the handicap of having to think in English and transmit their thoughts chiefly in English. Now, Gandhi, first of all, it is a very uncharitable remark, unnecessary remark, because there was no need. And it was also un inaccurate. Why? Because when we uh, read the biography of Ram Mohan Roy, Ram Mohan Roy um, grew up in a Bengali family. So of course, he knew Bengali. In those days, uh, Sanskrit was the means of um, learning about the, the Hindu scriptures and religions, so Ramon Roy knew Sanskrit. He then learned Arabic and Persian, because at that time Persian was still the, what we call as the court language. Many people uh, in the early 19th century, late 18th century, in all parts of India, they learned Persian. So he knew Bengali, Sanskrit, Arabic, Persian. He learned French, but only later in his life did he learn English much, much later in his life. So when Gandhi says that, well, Ramon Roy thought in English and transmitted it in English, that is definitely not correct. And Tagore was extremely critical of this. Uh, Ramon Roy also happens to be, in a way, you can say, the founder of what is known as the Brahmo movement. It was a movement uh, to reform Hindu society uh, and the Tagore's. I mean, Ramindranath Tagore's father, he was also a very prominent in that Brahmo Samaj. So Tagore had tremendous respect for Brahmo and Roy. And so Tagore then comes back and hits very hard. I strongly protest against Mahatma Gandhi's trying to drive down such great personalities as Brahmo and Roy. In his blind zeal for declaiming against our modern education, it shows that he is growing enamored of his own doctrines. In the modern age, Ram Mohan Roy had that comprehensive of comprehensiveness of mind to be able to realize the fundamental unity of spirit in not only Hindu and Mohammedan, but also Christian cultures. And then Tagore goes on to say, Ram Mohan Roy could be perfectly natural in his acceptance of the West only because his ed education had been perfectly Eastern. He had the full inheritance of the Indian wisdom. So, very strong remark. 
Now, what does Gandhi do? <laughs> Gandhi, uh, he doesn't really answer the rebuttal. He uses something which since then has become so, so popular. And he says, I hope I am as great a believer in free air as the great poet. And this is something that has been used in many, many arguments. I do, I want the cultures of all the lands to be blown about my hive, about my house, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by it. So it's not a direct rebuttal, but as I said, this quote of Gandhi became so, so famous. And almost anybody now, when we talk of multiculturalism, when we talk of liberalism, this again comes up. People say, oh yeah, I am open, but I refuse to be blown off. Okay, so uh, very interesting. So this is a photograph taken in um, Shanti Niketan. Uh, so this is, of course, Tagore, Gandhi, and then this third gentleman is C.F. Andrews, uh, a remarkable personality, a, a British, who came to India, stayed uh, throughout his life, and uh, we, we, we don't have the time to get into his biography, but amazing personality. He was the one who actually worked both with Gandhi and Tagore, so he knew them both very well. So now we come to perhaps the most intense and uh, direct and uh, um, scathing part of the debates. And so this was not about one particular topic. It encompassed many aspects. So you can call it the Charkha Swaraj non-cooperation boycott debates. Okay? So Charkha is a spinning wheel. Gandhi introduced this idea of each person in his or her home spinning. This is a small home scale spinning wheel. You spin and you, you, you get fabric out of cotton. And that he was uh, articulating that this would be a very good national movement if everybody did. Swaraj, again, uh, English translation is a little tricky, but almost everybody says home rule, so let's just stick to that home rule. Non-cooperation. So Gandhi, of course, came up with this satyagraha, this adherence to truth, and he said that, well, we have to um, show our displeasure or our refusal to obey British laws uh, by this non-cooperation movement, which will be non-violent. <coughs> And that would also include, because education, as I said, was completely governed by the British, uh, the students should boycott schools. So that was the framework, OK? And so now, what I'll do is they, incidentally, they met, the two of them, Gandhi and Tagore. They met in Tagore's house in Calcutta in 1921. And let's see how this debate started. So Gandhi started saying, Gurudev, you were yourself a leader and promoter of the Swadeshi movement. So if, when we look at biography of Tagore, Tagore did have involvement in a political movement called the Congo Congo 1905. Bengal, a province of India, was uh, proposed to be divided along sectarian lines. There would be a Hindu Bengal, a Muslim Bengal. And Tagore fought it vehemently. So that is what was known as the Swadeshi movement. So that's what Gandhi is implying. But then Tagore became disillusioned with political, political movements, and he kind of retreated to his poetry and drama and all that. So this is what Gandhi is saying. You were yourself a leader and promoter of the Swadeshi movement some 20 years ago. You always wanted Indians to stand on their own feet as Indians and not to be poor copies of Westerners. My Swaraj movement today is the natural offspring of your Swadeshi, join me now and fight with me for Swara. So Gandhi is extremely clear what he wants from Tagore, what he expects from Tagore. And what does Tagore say? Tagore says, Gandhi ji, the whole world is suffering today from the cult of a selfish and short-sighted nationalism. India has all down her history offered hospitality to the invader of whatever nation, creed, or color. I have come to believe that as Indians, we, don't, we not only have much to learn from the West, 
but that we also have something to contribute. We dare not shut the West out. The West's ideas and achievements would help Indians to learn how to collaborate amongst themselves. So Gandhiji then says, Gurudev, I have already achieved Hindu-Muslim unity. They go descended. He says, when the British either walk out or are driven out, keep in mind, this is 1921. India became independent in 1947, so this is 26 years before that. When the British either walk out or are driven out, what Gandhiji will happen then? Will Hindu and Muslim then live, lie down together peacefully? You know they will not. So Tagore is extremely clear. Then Gandhi comes back. He says, but Gurudev, my whole program for the winning of Swaraj is based on the principle of non-violence. That is why, as a poet who believes in peace, you can feel free to ally yourself with this peaceful movement and work for it. And so then Tagore says, Gandhiji, come and look over the edge of my veranda and look down there and see what your so-called non-violent followers are up to. So what was happening then and which was very common at that time is, as I said, this boycott of schools and it was also a boycott of foreign clothing, foreign textiles. So in, in those days what happened was they would collect, people would collect at a central location, they would bring their foreign cloth and that foreign cloth would be burned, okay? And so that would be, uh, you can say, a way of expressing their protest. So that is what Tagore is referring to. He says, look over the edge of my veranda. The non-cooperators had stolen pieces of foreign-made cloth from the bazaar in Chitpur Road and lit a bonfire with them in the courtyard you can see for yourself, there they are howling around it like a lot of demented dervishes. Is that non-violence, Gandhiji? We Indians are, as you know so well, a very emotional people. Do you think you can hold our non do you think you can hold our violent emotions under firm control with your non-violent principles? No, you know you cannot. Only when the children of our different religions communities and castes have been schooled together, can you hope to overcome the violent feelings which exist today? And <clears throat> I am reminded uh, my grandfather, who was in his 20s at that time, he told me that he also participated in some of these events. And uh, he, he told me that when they would do it, when they would light this bonfire and then they would sing and dance and it gave boost of adrenaline, no question about it. But after that, two days after that, three days after that, it's back to square one. So uh, what Tagore is hinting is this cultish uh, kind of fascination is what he was very much against. Okay? Whenever you try to defy something or play something based on pure raw emotion, he was completely against that. So, so that's that's the background. Then <clears throat> Gandhi said, well, um, okay, let me just skip because we, we may be running out of time. Uh, okay. So that this debate went on, I, I will just skip some. So Tagore then went on to accuse Gandhi of manipulating the people with symbols instead of substance. And he says, but Indians by nature have always been worshippers of symbols of images. So then Gandhi come, came back, countered back. He says, when talking of economic wrongs, Gandhi said it was legitimate to refer to foreign made cloth as impure. Only a word such as this, such as this would induce people to sacrifice the cloth and burn it. For Tagore, such hypnotism was a matter of shame. And so they realized that this discussion, or supposed discussion, was getting over. So Gandhi kind of gave up. Uh, I see my request for you is your, your help is almost hopeless. And then he said, well, you can ask your friends to, to spin. As I said, Gandhi's main idea was everybody should spin. 
this chat fire form. And this is where Tagore's humor and his brilliance comes. How does Tagore respond? Tagore says, Gandhi ji, poems I can spin, songs and plays I can spin, but of your precious cotton, what a mess I would make. <laughs> So then, this was the meeting, which, as you can see, didn't go very well. And then they took to writing. Gandhi, in his uh, uh, Young India, his publication, Tagore and Modern Review, and in some others. So it went back and forth. And it's a very long, uh, detailed uh, arguments. Of course, we, we don't have the time to go through it in detail, in, in, in completeness. I will just give you the flavor. Uh, but when one reads these articles, then uh, two things come out. One is, uh, of course, the power of their argument. And the second thing is how deep they thought about it. It was not just that they were writing it based on their emotions. They backed it up with facts, and not only facts, with their understanding of history, and not only that, even back to uh, the Hindu texts. So they quoted from Hindu texts, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita. So it's a remarkable uh, exchange. Anyway, so uh, let's see what Tagore has to say of this Swaraj. So Tagore, alien government in India is a veritable comedian. Today, it comes in the guise of the Englishman, Tomorrow, perhaps, as some other foreigner, the next day, without awaiting a jot of its virulence, it may, it may take the shape of our own countrymen. So just see how prescient it was. It may take the shape of our own countrymen, however determinedly we may try to hunt this monster of foreign dependence with outside lethal weapons. It will always elude our pursuit by changing its skin or its color. But if we gain within us the truth called our country, all outward maya will vanish of itself. And then he goes on to say that, I mean, it's a country not just because we were born in it. Uh, and he, he ends that paragraph with saying, but the true nature of man is his inner nature with its inherent powers. Therefore, that only can be a man's true country, which he can help to create by his wisdom and will, his love and his actions. So, Tagore's idea of country is very different from what we typically consider geographical space or things like that. And then, as I said, this is a long uh, argument, so I'll just uh, give you a little more flavor. So Tagore then attacks not just Gandhi, he's also implying, I mean, Gandhi was very popular by then. Um, he had many, many followers. So now Tagore is attacking his followers in a way, but obliquely, not very directly. What does he say? He says, stratagem in politics is a barren policy. This was a lesson of which we were sorely in need. All honor to the Mahatma. So he's glorifying Mahatma, Gandhi. All honor to the Mahatma who made visible to us the power of truth. But reliance on tactics is so ingrained in the cowardly and the weak that in order to eradicate it, the very skin must be sloughed off. Even today, our worldly wise men cannot get rid of the idea of utilizing the Mahatma at a secret and more ingenious move in their political capital. So now he is imputing that these followers of Mahatma they definitely are not at the spiritually elevated state of Mahatma. So they are using all this for their, you can say, own hands. So with their minds corroded by untruth, they cannot understand what an important thing it is that the Mahatma's supreme love should have drawn forth the country's love. The thing that has happened is nothing less than the birth of freedom. It is the gain by the country of itself. And then he attacks Mahatma. And he says, well, um, Gandhi had so many options. I mean, why did he choose this particular path? And so he says, he, he first explains why he's calling now Gandhi as the guru. 
And then he says, why should not our guru of today, who would lead us on the paths of karma, send forth such a call? Why should he not say, come ye from all sides and be welcome? Let all the forces of the land be brought into action. This is a very famous Upanishad expression. But for then alone shall the country. Freedom is in complete awakening, in full self-expression. God has given the Mahatma the voice that can call, for in him there is the truth. Why should this not be a long-awaited opportunity? So, so he's saying, why doesn't Gandhi do these, these? And then he says, but Gandhi's call came to one narrow field alone. To one and all, he simply says, spin and be. Spin and be. So he's now just uh, trying to demolish why this spinning and be weaving would not really uh, pass muster by Tagore. And so then he says this very famous Tagore quote, the charkha in its proper place can do no harm but will rather do much good. But where, by reasoned failure to acknowledge the differences in man's temperament, it is in the wrong place, their thread can only be spun at the cost of a great deal of the mind itself. Mind is no less valuable than cotton thread. So Tagore is extremely clear that we cannot let these raw emotions, these temporary uh, goals, ideals, uh, obstruct us on the path of this freedom of the mind. And then he comes back to this uh, burning of cloth. And then he says, well, the question of using or refusing cloth of a particular manufacturer. As I said, the idea was to boycott British cloth because it, was, it had completely decimated the Indian textile industry. Uh, so, the question of using or refusing cloth of a particular manufacturer belongs mainly to economic science. The discussion of the matter by our countrymen should have been in the language of economics. So, what Tagore is saying is, and which was also very true at that time, that who were uh, suffering from this boycott? What was happening is that, of course, this British cloth, uh, Gandhi had objection to it. But it was much, much cheaper than this so-called indigenous textile. So if you were a poor person and you used British cloth just because it was cheap, now you are being asked by all this mob to, to make a bonfire out of it. Who is being the sufferer? Okay. So we have completely uh, uh, kind of decoupled ourselves from the economics of it. That was what was the divorce major objection. And so he says, we take the course of confined, confirming ourselves in it by relying on the magical formula that foreign cloth is impure, thus economics is bundled out, and a fictitious moral dictum dragged into place. So, <clears throat> very, very powerful and very direct. And then he says, as clearly as possible, the command, <coughs> excuse me, the command to burn our foreign clothes has been laid on us. I, for one, am unable to obey it. I am against this terrible habit of blindly obeying orders, and I feel that the clothes to be burnt are not mine, but belong to those who most sorely need them. So, this is Tagore's uh, criticism. And then we come to this boycott of schools. Tagore says, well, okay, Gandhiji, you have said to boycott schools. But at that time, there was no alternative education system to impact, impart better education. So the existing British-sponsored education was undoubtedly abom abominably poor. And Tagore was a severe critic, but then he tells Mahatma Gandhi, our students are bringing their offering of sacrifice to what? Not to a fuller education, but to non-education. And this kind of program could not be sustained. So you see, it's very clear. And then we come to what, what is Gandhi's response. And Gandhi's response is very direct. Gandhi says that, let's talk of boycotting in schools, government schools and colleges. The training that was being given in those schools, what did it do 
well it rendered our students helpless and godless so if that is the kind of education that they were getting what matters if they don't get it what matters the least then he comes back to cloth he says it was our love of foreign cloth that ousted the wheel from its position of dignity therefore i consider it a sin to wear foreign cloth i must confess that i do not draw a sharp or any distinction between economics and ethics so if ethics dictates that i boycott foreign cloth economics should not come into that calculation at all that is gandhi's okay and so then and then gandhi uh, in a remarkable turn he says something to which again infuriates the guru so he says i do indeed ask the poet and the sage to spin the wheel as a sacrament and this is where the the part is he says when there is war the poet lays down the lyre the lawyer his law reports the school boy his books so it's very clear it's war it's war against this um this foreign uh, government foreign control and again tagore comes back and he he does not he does not like this so tagore was unwilling to suspend the poetic life to depart from the poet's religion so that is a very famous um, article by tagore the religion of a poet and there he articulates very well that for a poet nothing else matters but the articulation of his what is in his mind so to say that now this is war and so the poet should lay down his lyre they go completely disagree with this so he says to say, to demand otherwise is to destroy the swadharma of all creative minds and that is self defeating as a means however noble the ends hence they go speak to gandhi was that at no time should the poet lay down his lyre or the scholar his books for the sake of swaraj and he says the foundation of swaraj is in the mind it's not really a geographical place or a particular form of government he says the foundation of swaraj is in the mind with its diverse powers and its confidence in those powers goes on all the time creating swaraj for oneself so then the what does gandhi say gandhi says that tagore didn't really read me or didn't really understand he says all he knows about my movement is what is picked up from table talk so as i said it's kind of jalpa it's not really bad and poets are given to exaggeration poets are given to poetic license gurudev also does that and so uh gandhi says well gurudev implied that i want everybody to spin all the time but that's not the point i just said half an hour every day so that is uh, just very small sacrifice one can make so gandhi that's how he answers and then he says well i didn't just say charkha alone charkha is uh, amidst a broad set of activities uh, which promote all these things some of which tagore is very uh, favorable to and very uh, supportive of and, and tagore agrees with that part okay so i think uh, there, there there are some more things um which uh, one can talk about but i think I'll, i'll move on because we also have to uh, talk about then the question is were natural so gandhi as i said he was very respectful of tagore very differential to tagore every major um, activity gandhi would undertake he would write to tagore saying gurudev do i have your support gurudev do you agree with this so this is gandhi's questions to tagore about hindi okay hindi or vernacular and he says well is not hindi or urdu the only possible national language for interprovincial intercourse is it not desirable to give highest teachings through the vernaculars should not hindi be made a compulsory language in all post primary schools and what is tagore's answer tagore's answer is yes and no he says yes of course hindi is the only possible language but he points out it is a foreign language for some indians 
And Tagore, as you can see from his earlier debates, he doesn't like imposition. Imposition is something very uh, anatomical. So he says, it cannot be imposed. And here I'm reminded, um, when I was a very, I mean, maybe five, six year old kid, my mother recounted that, I don't remember, but she remembers, we were in a bus in Madras at that time, you see, called Madras, today it's called Chennai. This is late 1960s. So we were traveling in a bus, and uh, some people, they stopped the bus, asked us all to get down, and they set fire to the bus. And this was this famous, what is known as the anti-Hindi agitation. It's very um, uh, destructive, uh, destructive not just to life and property, but also to the idea of India. So, and there, the, the Dravidians, as we call them, the, their main argument was, why would you impose Hindi on us? Okay. So, in position, Tagore could not agree. And then he says, well, Hindi will have to remain optional until a new generation of politicians, um, and he was talking, of course, of the, the, the Congress at that time. So, uh, unfortunately, we still haven't reached that today. This was a discussion 100 years ago, but today, even today, we do not have um, a new generation or the present generation all across India who are very uh, fluent in Hindi or can have this kind of an interview. Okay. Then we come to the other major, major piece of debate. And this was regarding an earthquake. So what happened was in 1934, there was a massive earthquake in Bihar, and tremendous destruction. And Gandhi at once sent Rajendra Prasad, who was a, a very staunch follower of Gandhi, to do relief efforts there, and gave him, Gandhi, the reports. And Gandhi was at that time in Tamil Nadu. And he then said uh, in a statement, as you can read, <coughs> there is a divine purpose that works for the good of humanity. I believe this earthquake is a divine chastisement sent by God for our sins. And the sin was actually uh, based on Gandhi's at that time movement of um, untouchability or origins. Okay. So Gandhi was working to bring them into the Hindu society, and he was meeting fierce resistance. So he, uh, that's what he said. This earthquake is a divine chastisement. And when Tagore heard it, he was extremely furious. And so his response, as you can read, uh, I will just highlight the basic points. Blindly, the Mahatma Gandhi following, blindly following their own social custom of untouchability, of having brought down God's vengeance, vengeance upon certain parts of Bihar. Um, and it is unscientific. Uh, of course, as we understand science today, we can't really uh, understand what Gandhi had in mind, actually. Um, and then Tagore says, uh, I am compelled to utter a truism in asserting that physical catastrophes have their inevitable and exclusive origin in certain combination of physical facts. Okay, so very clear disagreement. What does Gandhi uh, and and Tagore also goes on to uh, say something uh, that you, I'm sure, will agree that if you make this argument that this is divine chastisement. Then it would better suit the psychology of Gandhi's opponents. And indeed, they said that. They said that Gandhi's efforts to bring in these untouchables to Hindu society is the <laughs> reason for which we have this divine chastisement. Okay, So Tagore is very, very clear. And he's very hurt. Uh, he's dismayed. He's exasperated. So now let's see what Gandhi says. Gandhi's um, argument is, is very simple, actually. Cuts through all this, and he says, I have long believed that physical phenomena produce results, both physical and spiritual. And I also hold the converse to be true. So if that's the case, we are we are mere mortals. How would we know the laws of God? And so if I believe as Gandhi did, 
that not even a leaf moves but by the will of the divine, then who are we to start asking questions as to, well, what is this divine chastisement? So I instinctively, look at the verse, I instinctively felt that the earthquake was a visitation for the sin of untouchability. Why punishment for it? And people, of course, started asking me all kinds of questions. Why punishment now? Why punishment here? Um, and so Gandhi says, well, who am I to answer that? I am not God. So why are you asking me these questions? Okay. So very, uh, very straightforward answer. But of course, it's not. I, I'm, I'm just encapsulating uh, and uh, summarizing. Uh, so it, it did go on, but we will move on. Uh, I, I just wanted, as, as I said in the beginning, they differed vehemently, but they had tremendous mutual respect. Okay? And again and again, people ask them, reporters ask Gandhi, and they ask the court, well, there are differences with this person. Uh, what about it? And they both said, well, they make us, they, they have enriched that friendship. They have deepened this friendship. Because unless you can have a frank discussion, what good is this kind of friendship or respect? Okay. So, Tagore, um, he had this Shantiniketan Vishwa Bharati, so he nominates Gandhi to be a life trustee. Uh, and then, again, very famous quote of Tagore, it is in the fitness of things that Mahatma Gandhi, frail in body, and devoid of military resources should call up the immense power of the meek that has been lying waiting in the hearts of the destitute and in such humanity of India. Uh, and then perhaps this is the quote that I like the best of Tagore about Gandhi. He says, great as he is as a politician, as an organizer, as a leader of men, and as a moral reformer, he is greater than all of these as a man. <clears throat> because none of these aspects and activities limits his humanity. So just from these quotes, you can see how tremendous respect Tagore had for them. But I think uh, this respect is best displayed by a <clears throat> by an incident. So Gandhi, as you know, uh, he undertook many of these fasts for a variety of reasons. This fast was actually because uh, a decision was made that there would be elections with separate electorates. And Gandhi, at that time, he was in Pune, and he uh, decided to take this fast unto death. Fast unto death means I will not have any solid uh, or, or nutritious liquid food until this promulgation is, is revoked. So, uh, of course, people are very concerned. Tagore, when he heard this news, he was A, not physically very well. B, he had just learned that his grandson had died in Germany. So, emotionally, physically, uh, very weak. But just when he heard that Gandhiji decided to go on this fast and to death, he took a train from, I mean, these are opposite parts of India, Bengal and Pune, opposite parts of, he took a train, went to Gandhiji's ashram. And uh, luckily, when Tagore reached, by that time, the problem was sorted out, Gandhi had decided to break his fast. So Tagore goes, uh, Gandhi is given, uh, and whenever Gandhi would break his fast, he would be given a glass of orange juice. So incidentally, Indira, Indira Priyadarshini Nehru, who later on became Indira Gandhi, she was the one who gave him this orange juice. Gandhi took it, and then that was a Monday. On Mondays, Gandhi had what is known as Mon He would not speak. So he gave a piece of paper to Mahadev Desai, uh, again, a remarkable personality. If, if someday we get a chance to talk about him, Gandhi, people call him Gandhi's secretary, but he was much, much more than that. <clears throat> so Gandhi gives uh, Mahadev a piece of paper. Mahadev brings it to Tagore. And uh, Gandhi wanted Tagore to sing a very famous composition of Tagore. And uh, Tagore immediately, he, he sings that song. It's a very famous uh, song. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, 
sing for you the first part of it. Jivano jakuno shukai jai koruna tharai esho shakolo madhuri lokai jai jito shudhar ashe esho. It's a long song, but I think this song expresses his uh, respect more than anything. Then, uh, when um, this is late 1930s, uh, Tagore Shantiniketan has a tremendous problem with funds. He tells Gandhiji, Gandhi, I know of no one else but you who can help. And Gandhiji immediately helps. Immediately means he first says, OK, don't worry, I'll do my best. And then he gathers 60,000 rupees. At that time, it was a big amount. Gandhi didn't mention it was from GD Birla, Prachandas Birla, a very famous industrialist. Gandhi doesn't mention, but gives this money to Tagore. Uh, and then what does, because we're getting, getting to then, what does Gandhi say on Tagore? Uh, again, uh, I will not read the entire thing, but I will just read what he said when he heard of Tagore's death in 1941. In the death of Ramindranath Tagore, we have not only lost the greatest poet of the age, but an ardent nationalist who was also a humanitarian. There was hardly any public activity on which he has not left the impress of his powerful personality. He has left a legacy to the whole nation, indeed to the world. May the noble soul rest in peace. So, and uh, when we uh, read about these debates, when we uh, read about them, what is most uh, enlightening are their letters. So I've just given you a picture. This is a letter that Gandhiji writes. And I, you can't read it, first of all, because it's in Gandhi's sprawling handwriting. But he is writing this letter at 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, 3 o'clock in the morning. Why? Because that day, at 12 noon, he would undertake a fast. And so he's writing to the course saying, please bless this if you agree. And and this is where <clears throat> their honesty comes in. He says, if you don't agree, just tell me. That's perfectly fine. So, so this is one of those letters. And uh, again, uh, this is a letter that uh, Tagore wrote, dear Mahatma Ji. And this is Tagore. He had an operation for which he needed to be under anesthesia. So when he comes out of anesthesia, he writes, that the first thing that welcomed me to this world of life after the period of stupor I passed through was your message of affectionate anxiety. So these letters, they kind of show how much, <coughs> how much they uh, loved and respected each other. So then the question comes, this is my penultimate slide. How, how did this help? I mean, how, what did one learn from the other? And uh, um, I think what Gandhi learned from this set of debates is that the, the highest place one can give, one has to give, is to one's own conscience. Uh, then patience is needed. I mean, we have to keep in mind, Gandhiji, some, sometime in the 1920s, he said, I will give you Swaraj in 10 years. Okay. So Gandhiji was, he was not impatient, but he was very ambitious. And Gandhiji learned from Tagore that patience is very much needed. And Gandhi himself says, I learned from Gurudev how not to lose sight of post independence What will happen after India becomes politically independent? What did Tagore learn? Tagore learned that you have to practice what you preach. What you preach. Uh, just to give you an example, in Shantiniketan, at that time, inter-caste dining was not prevalent. So you did have communal meals, but one group of people here, one group of people on another caste there. Gandhi goes to Shantiniketan and he says, Gurudev, what is this? And that uh, admonition by Gandhi kind of made, made Tego take this instantaneous decision that from now on, no more this segregated, caste segregated dining. Okay. Then, um, 
something else which uh, Tagore started, but it, for some reason it didn't continue. And that is, in uh, in those days, uh, there was not a sanitary system as we understand today. So there had to be some people who were employed who would take all this what they called night soil and take it out. Okay. So in Gandhi's ashrams, in Phoenix, in Tolstoy, in Sabarmati, there was no particular person employed. Ashramites had to do it. In Shantiniketan, no. So Gandhi again points this out. Gurudev, what is this? So Gurudev starts <laughs> implementing it, but after some time, it, uh, he, for whatever reason, I don't know. And uh, lastly, just again, because we are so short of time, uh, Tagore says uh, in his in Gandhiji's 70th birthday, that Gandhi's realm of activity in practical politics was one of the makers of history. So you can preach something, but when you practice with so many people, there are certain things that they go on. Okay. And uh, just to just to set it all, there was an overarching Hindu framework for the debates. And I'm saying this because some scholars have said, well, the differences were because Tagore believed in the Upanishads and Gandhi believed in Bhagavad Gita. And that is absolutely not, not tenable. Because there's no difference as such between the teachings of Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita. OK, so that doesn't hold. Uh, but the, the way one can understand their differences within the Hindu framework is, and this is something they themselves said, although not so many words. When Gandhi was asked, what is your life's philosophy? Give it in as few words as possible. Gandhi said, I will give it in three words. Okay, what are the three words? Renounce and rejoice. Okay. And uh, one can, of course, understand it very easily that if you can, this ascetic spirit, if it can renounce everything, then of course you will get this unlimited joy. What did Tagore say? Rejoice and renounce. Just the opposite. Rejoice, because for Tagore, when we say in something that we say in uh, the Hindu framework, uh, such an ananda, that means the, 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 the third part is the ananda part, the joy of um, kind of when this you reach enlightenment, that joy, for, for Tagore, that was the crux of everything. So for Tagore, it was, you can say, the opposite in the sense that if you can find joy in everything, then you will automatically renounce. You will not hold on to things. So um, with this, I thank you so much for all your patience. And uh, we do have some time about, I would say, eight, nine minutes for q and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, regarding the, uh, the three forms of, uh, of debate, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Radha sounds like uh, something that uh, that we would today call deep listening. It is listening, yes, but listening complemented with counter arguments. Deep listening is a prerequisite to Vada, yes. In Vada, it is you, you do deep listening, yes. then you articulate to your opponent, is this what you are saying? And only when the opponent agrees that, yes, this is indeed what I said, yeah. do you then come with your counter Right. So, so uh, where is the emphasis in Baba? Is it on the listener or on the presenter? Good, because there's, it's an interplay. Yes, it's an interplay. Yeah. Uh, but. Is there an emphasis on one of the, the emphasis on is on establishing what one so is articulating. But you are, as I said, you do not do that by trying to twist um, uh, the, the words or try to find a weakness in your uh, opponent and then just kind of hone him on it. Yeah. That's yeah. not it. Yeah. Well, I found it fascinating this week forms that you talked about uh, I have never come across this before. Uh, yes, uh, these are, yeah. In a general way I have, but, uh, but uh, that, that was very nice and quite. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, I found so much that uh, I was really uh, very impressed with how many things in this debate 
really touch on issues internal, uh, interpersonal, uh, but also international that are still very relevant today. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and so I, I found you have articulated about yeah, you have very succinctly uh, put it. And in fact, uh, Omar Rona says that these debates, maybe they were for India, but the whole world benefited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And indeed, some of these points do have salience even today. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Tirita. Thank you so much for this enlightening talk. You have done a lot of research going through all these things. Uh, very, very impressive. I was uh, questioning in my mind as to whether <clears throat> the freedom of India in the mind of the goal and in the mind of Gandhi, were these two different things? Because when I look at your saying that Jagor was freedom of mind is the one that you so there was nothing like a geographical freedom, this is the part of India and we want mother India. Whereas Gandhi's way of thinking was that we want to get rid of the British Empire, the land that he occupies, we are rid of that thing. And that's why he had all these Chaka and other movements, so that we can get this land of ours, which we call Mother India. So was Tagore basically different in his thinking? Well, the way I would put it is, Gandhi's ideal was Ram Rajya. In order to achieve Ram Rajya, you had to get political freedom. Otherwise, there was no right. way. For right. Tagore, um, if, you, if freedom of the mind was the highest, again, there is no way you could achieve that without political independence. But political independence was not necessary and sufficient. It was just one of the preconditions. But on top of that, you have to then build all these layers. Yeah. Only then could you. No, I mean. Yeah. So for both of them, whatever their ultimate goal was, political freedom was an absolute must. But it need not just stop there. Okay. It had it to be. Because freedom the, of mind you can have in jail. I mean, you can be surrounded by everything you have in mind. Well, so I mean. The political freedom of freedom doesn't matter anymore. The so freedom of mind in the jail is, again, that freedom is not what Tagore had in mind. Because in jail, you cannot articulate what you want to say. I mean, Gandhi, when he went to jail, not only could he not write, he was not even allowed to read anything that was, that was deemed political in nature by the British. So, uh, freedom of the mind, yes, you can think whatever you want, but if you want to imbibe ideas, what is happening in the rest of the world, what you think, if you want to disseminate it, that was not possible. So, no, but that's what I thought that when he is talking about the freedom of mind, he has written points about that. Of course, of course. Of course. Of that. So, very interesting. But Ramji, I have. Uh, uh, question maybe is to Arun, maybe not, but you, you earlier you mentioned about Gandhi and Tagore debating about Ram Mohan Roy and uh, who was the other one? Tila. Tila. And, and then talking about the, which language, the vernacular language they should think about English. So you said that uh, Ram Mohan had run, learned Persian, Arabic, in many languages, uh, both Bengali and English. The question is when did he start writing? Was that in English or other languages also? Uh, I don't know the answer uh, because Ramon Roy, uh, his writings, uh, most of his writings were, I mean, his earlier writings are all in Bengali. And uh, <clears throat> when he was dealing with the British government, of course, his writings were in English. So he was equally at ease in Bengali and English. The, the thinking process that maybe Gandhi was mentioning is what was it being said in English, and maybe he wasn't agreeing with Ram Mohan. I mean, the, the, the background to this is uh, Ram Mohan Roy believed, it was, you can imagine, this was early 1800s. He believed that we can convince the British rulers that, well, you can help us in some of these 
reforms in the Hindu society, Sati being the most yeah. And to Gandhi, that was an anathema. Because why would you go to the British to tell us to do things? So I think that was what was playing in his mind. He didn't say like that. These are my uh, interpretation. The, the reason I mentioned this, with, because this is relevant today, the Indian Parliament Act still today says that all the laws in Indian Parliament will be enacted in English first, and then translated in other languages. So this, this and that to, creates a huge problem because there are many, many concepts where there are no mappings between English and the vernacular language. Yeah, and that becomes an issue many times. The concepts cannot be at least enacted in laws or in very peculiar ways. I completely agree. Yes, Bella. Thank you so much for this uh, entire presentation and insight into the minds of these two visionary uh, leaders. And it was just wonderful listening to you. Um, I, and of course, you're singing. <laughs> so I was just uh, wanting to know a little bit more about uh, you said that Tagore was against temporary goals, uh, the burning of cloths, spinning and weaving, because it was decoupled from economics. So if you could elaborate on that. So uh, I mean, what was happening, as, as I said at that time, was that there was this mass movement. Mass movement brings with it this mob kind of psychology. So mobs would gather, mobs would get all this foreign cloth, make a bonfire, and the sufferers were those who could least afford the cloth. That was what Tagore had in mind. That if I'm an aristocrat and I have some foreign cloth in my house and I give that for bonfire, that is not an issue. But we were, and you can imagine, the, the, the economic condition of India at that time was so abysmal. And these poor people, if they could afford only one piece of cloth, they were buying British cloth only because it was cheaper. So to now force them to abandon that and use homemade khadi, which was number one, more expensive and more difficult to handle. I mean, we have, <laughs> when you read Gandhi's biography, uh, in the ashram, Ladies complaining to Gandhi that, okay, you just tell, uh, use khadi, but don't, do you know how difficult it is to wash a khadi sari and how difficult it is to kind of, after you wash and dry it, to wear it again? So uh, the point that Tagore was making is that this mob psychology, what it does is it corrupts the mind. I mean, you, you, you feel good. And that cannot stand the test of the, the, the freedom of the mind. That's what he was saying. It's not that if you give up your, voluntarily give up your foreign cloth, I mean, the, the, the principle he agreed with. But what typically happens is, when we get to these mass movements, soon this mob psychology kind of takes over. And that, to Tagore, was completely indefensible. Uh, yes, the figure. I have a small question that, uh as uh, Rabindranath Tagore was more concerned about the post-independent uh, situation of India or India, I may say. So is this a reason he was more concerned about the freedom of mind rather than the freedom of India politically? Because uh, if you see the first, uh, the economic structure of their own family, they were kind of the opponents in the economics uh, to uh, the British because they first came up with the ship industry and everything, though they failed. But they were kind of in a competition. They were in a situation to keep it a tough fight. To so his grandfather, Tarokanath, yeah. he was a, you can say, he made huge money because of the British. Mm -hmm. In shipping and in Indigo. At that time, Indigo was a very, very precious dhar. And Tarokanath, Again, we will not get into the detail, but he made lots of money. But that I don't think is what Tagore is saying. What Tagore is saying is freedom of the mind can come only if you are politically free. But just being politically free does not automatically translate to freedom of the mind. That's what he's trying to articulate again. Yes, Pandit Ji. 
I like your lecture, but these two great stalwarts of Indian society, how much of their philosophy is, is adopted today in India? Oh, that is something which if you bring in three people, you'll get four different answers. So uh, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. And I mean, my answer is not a whole lot. I mean, we have abandoned Gandhi, and much before that, we abandoned Tagore. So uh, we pay lip service. I mean, second October, we sing some bhajans, and Tagore's birthday, we sing some of his songs. But uh, in, in terms of uh, reading them or trying to follow them, I mean, there are some Gandhians still. Uh, but the numbers and their influence is very much. Thank you, Dhiruddha. Yes, Raj. So, the non-cooperation movement, what I understand, is one of the major objectives of that. Major objective of that was uh, to bring people together, to bring people out, because they were all segregated, and that, that was not related to economics or something like that. Can you please comment on that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the basic, I mean, when Gandhi comes back from South Africa and he, uh, his guru was actually Gokhale, Gokhale gives him one very precious advice. He says in the Indian National Congress meeting, you see these people, these all stalwarts of the Congress, they come, they make speeches in English, they go. If you are really interested to work for India, just tour around. Just see India, and Gandhi follows them. For one year, he extensively travels. And what he then finds is that the people of India, uh, they have no kind of correspondence or no uh, relationship with this freedom movement which he thinks of. So his chief goal is to involve the people. Because only then can it become, because if nonviolence has to be the basis, and then you need the force of numbers. And the way to bring in all that, you said, all these people who were had no interest, actually, because it didn't affect them. These Indian National Congress meetings were basically, you can say, uh, the preserve of the elite class. So this is, those are Gandhi's, you can say, brilliant insights that we need to involve the common people. In order to involve the common people, we need to explain to them in their terms why it is that this is needed. And that is what Gandhi then does so miraculously. And only then does it become the kind of uh, mass protest that then shakes the British Empire, the, the Dandi march, and all those other things. So it is not more than, it is much, much more than the mob. Kind of oh, yes, it's absolutely, absolutely. It's much more than that, no question about it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you.